The day is March, March 28th, 2016 at about 10 p.m. or a.m. rather. I am here with uh, Mr. Fred Collins. Uh, Mr. Collins served in the Second World War and has graciously allowed me to uh, interview him about his services and his life. So um, to just get into it, uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, where you were born, when you were born, etc., before the war? Mm. Well, uh, I don't remember this very well. I was born on April 13, 1921, in Roundup. That's what the record is, so I have to go by it, but I don't have any memory of it at all. My dad worked at a store in Muscle Shell, but uh, Roundup was where I was born. That's not too far away. And uh, I don't, uh, we, we didn't live in my muscle shell very long till Dad had to look for an, for another job because the one in muscle shell was running out. So he he got a job in Arvada, Wyoming, and so I lived there for a while from uh, until about 1927, I guess. No, it was longer than that. Uh, mother died in 1927. I was about a little over six years old. I don't remember a thing about my mother. And that was in Arvada. Uh, Arvada isn't much of a town either. My dad worked in a lumber and hardware store there until business uh, went south and he got a job at Edgar, Montana. Same kind of a job with Lumber and Hardware Store. And I graduated from high school at Edgar in 1939. I had a brother, Jack, who was a year older than I was. And he graduated a year ahead of me. And in, uh, in, in the summer of 1941, he joined the Army. I think he was smart enough to see what was what was about to happen, and uh, I in, in uh, December seventh was a Sunday, and I was waiting at the gymnasium for a few other guys to come around for shooting baskets, and uh, the guy was late and he came in and says, the Japs have attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, I knew nothing at all about who Pearl Harbor was. I thought I knew who the Japs were. But uh, that that didn't register at all. But the next day at, on the job, we, Dad and I sat around listening to the radio and there was nothing on it except war news. and. Franklin Roosevelt, the president, announced that we have declared war against Japan. And uh, it, it was the next day on the 9th of December, I went to Billings to enlist in the Army. And uh, a lot of details that I have forgotten there, but it was on December 12th, and I think it was in Missoula here, that I became a member of the armed forces, and uh, and it took uh, took quite a while to. That was December 12th, and it was on February 1st, 1944, that our crew landed in Italy. And you, you were part of the 455th bomb group. I think so. Yeah, and what was your what is your plan that you guys? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> we was on a B-24 bomber, and the, the 15th Air Force was in Italy. And I, I, there were several bomber groups there, and I guess I was the 455th or 454th, I don't remember which one. It, but uh, we were, I think we were the first bomber group to land in in southern Italy. Uh, the, 
the army had invaded Italy from Sicily, and I guess it took the, the Corps of Engineers a while to get a landing strip there for bombers. But, uh, and we were supposed to, after 50 missions, we could get back home. Well, we had a couple of tough ones. One was it in uh, Romania, that other oil refinery that we bombed it. That was a pretty heavily defended target. And it was bombed many, many times, but we were only there once. And and uh, we had another tough one at Vienna, or near Vienna, in Austria, to bomb a ball, ball bearing factory. And uh, a lot of milk runs, as we called them. One of them was to bomb troop concentrations in northern Italy. And I thought, troop concentrations? Are we bombing people, you know? Well, I guess everything's fair in love and war. And uh, then one day we were being briefed to bomb a target in Berlin. Number one target of the whole European theater. And we were scheduled to uh, bomb them with the Eighth Air Force from England, which would have a fighter escort which was necessary and a thing like that. But the bad news was, and there was nothing but bad news here, there was uh, fog over the channel, which meant that the 8th Air Force was going to stay on the ground with their fighter escort. And uh, from sunny southern Italy, we would be going by ourselves. Another bad news was we might spot P-51s and 38s over the target, but we were not to trust them. Those were the best fighters that the United States had, and, uh, but they were on lend lease to Russia, and we were not to trust them. And, and here I'm sitting thinking we were allied with Russia. Why couldn't we trust them? And it took several years later to realize that we couldn't because it was Russia. <laughs> and our relationship with Russia today is pretty rocky. And our relationship with Japan and Germany that we were fighting then is is friendly this year. So it's it's a bunch of politics that I don't know much about. But uh, another thing against us was that Berlin was the extent of our bombing range. To get beyond that, we didn't have enough fuel to get back to our target. And also, depending on our position in the formation, we might not have enough fuel to get back, but they hoped that we could get back south of the Alps. So in case we had to bail out, we'd be in friendly territory. And I'm thinking, bail out? I'm not a paratrooper. I knew how to buckle on my parachute, but but pulling a ripcord, I, I'd never been experienced in that, and I, and I, and I was absolutely scared. The enlisted men were released from briefing. We were supposed to go to our plane and check out all our equipment. And <coughs> I didn't get in the plane. I stood on the landing field just as scared as I could be afraid to die. And to me at that time, the word God was a cuss word. If I believed in God, I would know what I would answer. But from somewhere, <laughs> there came the idea, maybe there is a God. And I stood there crying and I said, God, if you get me back from this mission, I'll go to church every Sunday for the rest of my life. Well, about then, the officers had come in from their briefing, the pilot, the co-pilot, the navigator, and engineer of the bombardier. And uh, they all got into the plane except for the pilot. And he put his arm around my shoulder. And he never gave me a direct order to get into that plane. 
I don't know whether he said anything, but his arm around my shoulder said quite a bit. Well, we got into the plane and we went on our mission. And somewhere along the line, we turned around and came back. We didn't finish. We, I don't know where we dropped our bombs. But you don't land with B-24s with 10 tons of bomb in them. So, mm -hmm. so they were dropped somewhere. And uh, there was the Red Cross, big smiles on their faces, hot coffee and fresh donuts. And boy, I don't think donuts before or since have tasted as good as those that they did. And a few days later, there was a notice on the bulletin board that all crews on the awarded mission to Berlin will be credited with one mission. That made 49 for us, a whole lot closer to 50 than 48 was. And the next few days, another announcement on the bulletin board said that all crews with 49 missions will be sent back to the States. And I spent the rest of the war in Southern California, at San, uh, San Bernardino, and I was there during the Battle of the Bulge, and I had more information on the Battle of the Bulge than I did at the uh, D-Day invasion of France. And being in Italy at that time, I didn't get a whole lot of excitement about it, but this Battle of the Bulge was terrible. And I thought, have we come this far in the war to finally lose it? Well, it wasn't long after that that the war with Germany was over with. They had surrendered. Hitler had committed suicide. Franklin Roosevelt had died. <laughs> and things, well, I realized people are mortal. And uh, the war with, with uh, Japan was still going on, so the war wasn't over. There wasn't anything to celebrate. My brother had been killed in that war, and, and now we were just waiting time. The atom bomb had been dropped on Japan a couple of times, and that war finally ended in, I think, August of 44. And I was among the early ones to be released from the war because I had been overseas and been an early recruit. So somewhere during, during 1944, in, this, in the late summer, I was discharged and came home. And I was uh, hired again by the boss to work in the lumber and hardware store. I don't know how much of this you want after the war. Oh, no, keep going. I keep on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got, to, I was working in Edgar, Montana and in Bridger, Montana. and I was transferred to Worland, Wyoming. And I was in the process of going to church every Sunday, according to my bargain with God. And people have said, you know, you can't bargain with God like that. Well, I had no idea what was legal and what was illegal, because I was pretty French at it. But I was going to church, and, <clears throat> and I'd, I'd been in church before, but it meant nothing at all to me. I'd, probably had heard of Moses and David and Jesus and Matthew and all those, but I, nothing registered. I was about as unspiritual as you could possibly be. But uh, one night the preacher said God has showed his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I thought, boy, that is a lot of love. I knew something about my love for the country and not willing to die for it. I would fight for it, but 
but to die for it, that took more love than what I had. And here was God with all of this love. And I guess about the only thing I could say about that is I accepted that love. And my life was turned around. And when I went to work the next morning at the Lumman Hardware store, I, I didn't stay in the store waiting for a customer to come in because there were other people to do that. I went out to the lumber yard, straightened up every pile of lumber we had, picked up weeds and sticks from the ground and getting ready for inspection, I guess. But all the time I was doing that, I was going over the, Apo the Apostles' Creed. I didn't understand a word of it, but I believed every word of it. And that uh, God, the Creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, that was a bunch of Greek to me. But I believed it because I was a Christian now, and that, that's what Christians believed. And uh, it was some time after that that I had a Sunday school class of high school kids, about 10 or 12 of them in that group, and just a small church. And boy, you get a church today with 12 high school kids in the Sunday school class, it's, got to be a pretty big church, but but that one was, those, those kids gave a lot of attention to what I was saying to them, and they invited me to go with them to a summer camp for high school kids, and it was, uh, it was because of that that I thought I ought to be a teacher. If I had a, that much influence with those kids, I'd better be a teacher, and so I quit my job and went to college. Uh, benefit of the GI Bill of Rights. I never had to pay a nickel for my education, and and I uh, I was preparing to be a teacher. Got through three years of college, and uh, there was a situation come up where I was confronted with whether I was going to be a teacher or a preacher. And that was one big decision that I had to go through. And I chose to be a preacher instead, which meant I had to go to school again. And I'm not much of a scholar, but that all, all of that, I went to seminary for two years in, in Kentucky. And after that, I just needed to get back to Montana. That was all the formal education I could handle at the time. Besides which, I think my GI Bill had run out. <laughs> so I was, so I was back here in Montana, and was admitted into the conference and appointed to churches, and I did that for 33 years. I thought it was a pretty good investment of my time. And then I retired in 1986, and here I am, what, 30, 30, long time afterwards, <laughs> from 86 to 16, what's that? 30 years. 30 years. I'm pretty good at, at uh, retirement. No one has found any fault with the way I've done it. You're going to ask a question. No, no, go ahead. So that's my life. Well, thank you for agreeing to do an interview with me. It's been a pleasure.